Uh, I'm François Roux. I'm the uh, Senior Advisor for European Affairs at uh, Egmont, and I'm uh, delighted to moderate this webinar on the European uh, Green Deal. Many thanks to um, the Egmont team for the preparatory work. And I'd like to start with a few words of uh, context. The European Green Deal is one of the very trendy subjects in the Brussels uh, bubble. Uh, at Egmont, we have chosen to approach it through three uh, different uh, angles. Uh, first of all, the, the EU Commission's objectives of 2021, the relevance of these priorities in the international context, and finally, the involvement of uh, soci uh, civil society in the European and Green Deal. These uh, themes will be uh, introduced by three members of our panel today, Mrs. Sarah Nellen, Deputy Head of Cabinet of Vice President Franz Timmermans, Jean-Pascal Van Iperzel, IPCC Vice Chair, Professor of Climatology and Environmental Science in Louvain-la-Neuve, and Nicolas Van Nuffel, um, in charge of Climate Advocacy at the National Center for Cooperation and Development and President of the Belgian Climate Coalition. Many thanks to all of all three of you for giving us uh, some of your very precious time. Before we start, uh, I would like to make a few brief points on procedure. This is a, a public event. The session will be recorded. The language will be English. The presentation by the panelists will be followed by a question and answer session. And may I suggest that all of those of you, and I know yet you're quite a number out there who want to raise a question and do so by using the chat box, which will be monitored by, by my team. Um, now, turning to the uh, first theme uh, that we had foreseen for today, um, namely um, the uh, European Green Deal as such, um, 2021 should be the year for the adoption of the first ever uh, European climate law. At uh, its December session in 2020, uh, the European Council adopted a series of initiatives related to climate change, flagging its uh, new ambition to reach the greenhouse gas emission reduction target of at least 55% by 2030. So what we see is that the deadlines are becoming shorter, that the pressure for more ambitious objectives is growing. So my question to you, Sarah, is, are these EU climate objectives realistic in a world which is facing a um, major sanitary crisis, which is still in full swing, and in a world with a rather weak multilateral system? Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Francois. Thank you for the invitation as well. Um, and I'm sorry for the setting here. It's too sunny in my house. It's the first time I have this in months. So, uh, <laughs> but let's take it from the positive side um, and have an, uh, a positive view on, um, well, what you call uh, in the title of the session, uh, the Green Deal one year after and, and the perspectives. Let's be optimistic. Um, before answering your questions, I think it would be good uh, for a minute to take you back to uh, the origins of the Green Deal and to remind uh, the audience that actually it was within the first uh, two weeks of uh, the uh, von der Leyen's commission um, start that the Green Deal was put on the table and that um, we presented it, uh, showing it actually as uh, clearly a, a political priority, a number one priority. Um, and maybe one word to add as well, I think that the ambition level and the dynamic uh, that we presented with it uh, was never, had never been possible without um, youngsters in Europe, youngsters all around in streets in Europe asking um, governments nationally and at the European level to act. Um, and that is a sign of uh, the positivism and the optimism mm -hmm. that we can have, because um, it's amazing that a schoolgirl uh, sitting in front of a Swedish parliament has influenced uh, the whole of Europe and the ambition of, of the politics of today. And um, that is a good sign, because what is often see, what is often perhaps a, a bigger enemy uh, than everything else is the uh, attitude of um, what we can call climate depression, uh, feeling paralyzed as if nothing is possible and not acting while a lot of action is possible. 
we were acting quickly because um, we have some experience in Europe that um, often the agenda that is planned for is overtaken by events. So we wanted to present the Green Deal before perhaps the next migration crisis of a new financial crisis would come along. But no, it was something else, something we had not expected. But luckily, we were ready and had our fundamentals in place when COVID came along. Um, we had just presented a climate law. We had some deliverables of the Green Deal already on the table. I remember the week before I went into lockdown, we still had a circular economy package uh, presented. Uh, but yeah, of course, everybody's life uh, changed uh, in March last year. Um, and um, looking back at it, looking one year later at um, that uh, event, the crisis, the COVID crisis, I think we can be um, actually happy. We, we, we don't, we're not happy with the crisis, let me be clear on that. But the way we managed the recovery package and what is called next generation EU, there again, a link to our youth and our youngsters, because this is uh, something we have to do to preserve their future. But the package on the table, uh, and it has been uh, money like never seen before, I think, at European level, mm -hmm. uh, the MFF and the next generation EU uh, of 750 billion, um, and especially the recovery and resilient funds has clearly the green and the digital digital transition anchored uh, firmly down into it uh, with a 37% uh, climate uh, mainstreaming target um, in the RRF. But not only that, uh, there is the do no significant harm initiative because obviously to be effective, you need all uh, policies to go in the same direction or at least not be counterproductive. And uh, that is as well what is inbuilt in those funds, um, those principles. And obviously um, the, um, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and the commission is in a strong dialogue with all the uh, member states currently on uh, the exact nature and the scope of the reforms. And uh, it is challenging, of course, challenging not to do what we did in the previous crisis in 2009, um, that where the reflex was to fall back on everything that we know and to reconstruct what we know, to protect what we know, while here the policy challenge and the, uh, the ambition is to go in a new direction and to uh, build up a new economy, an economy that is sustainable uh, for the future. So yes, I believe, uh, it is uh, realistic, it is feasible, it is necessary. It's um, the only way uh, for the longer term to keep our economies going, to go in that new direction and to have actually also in a way an advantage uh, compared to others. Because although today um, the international landscape looks different, that was not the case last year. Uh, we were not sure of what the outcome of the US election was, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was more challenging, but I think um, Europe has proved, uh, like it did also with the Paris Agreement, that uh, if we keep our line, uh, it is not excluded that others don't follow. And today, this year, we have a different outlook internationally, absolutely, of course, with the US uh, um, new government in place, but all the other partners internationally, like Japan, like uh, South Korea, um, uh, are also uh, committing to climate uh, neutrality and uh, are actually, um, well, we're not alone anymore. We've set uh, some direction and we stick to it and we hope that uh, many more will follow because of course it's needed. Uh, often you hear the criticism, well, uh, Europe should not uh, go uh, first, stick it next neck out, because we are not the ones, the, the, the biggest em emitter. Uh, well, we think differently. Uh, look at the historic uh, emissions of Europe, then you have a different picture if you compare worldwide. But also we believe in this, and that was the Green Deal from the start, uh, presented as a growth strategy. Um, we mm. need this uh, direction, climate neutrality, resource efficient economy, nature protection as part of um, the kind of growth that we want in the future. And perhaps to, um, to um, quickly say something still on the Green Deal itself, it is absolutely not limited to climate. I think that is a bit the novelty of uh, what um, the von der Leyen Commission put on the table. There are, you could say, three pillars. Obviously, the climate pillar is an important one. 
um, and we have made progress immediately after the Green Deal was presented. There was a European Council summit in December um, mm -hmm. 2019, which where leaders committed as the high, at the highest level to climate neutrality in 2050. One year after the last European Council in December committed to a 55% target in 2030. But we have more. There is the pillar on nature and biodiversity. Um, there as well, uh, the urgency is high. Uh, people speak about the sixth mass extinction. We are losing a million uh, species. We are losing tropical rainforests. Um, this is a crisis and words are important. My boss uh, speaks about an ecocide. Um, so action here with the biodiv biodiversity strategy, with a form to fork strategy, um, with many more things to come and the international level as well, where the Kunmin um, biodiversity uh, COP uh, is also on the horizon, where we would love to make it a um, Paris moment. Um, so this pillar is very important. And the third pillar of the Green Deal is everything relinked to resources use. Um, the products we made, um, if you uh, project worldwide the, um, the, um, the growth in uh, resources uh, that will come with population growth or uh, development of countries, uh, plastic will double in the next 20 years. So according to those projections, um, by, 1960, by 2060, um, the uh, use of resources will be triple worldwide. So this is not sustainable either. And therefore the focus on circular economy and uh, on a new product policy, for instance, initiatives the commission will come forward with later this year, just to show that the Green Deal is a comprehensive policy vision and that all of these elements are of course linked. The extraction of resources has a CO2 footprint, et cetera, et cetera, uh, has or leads to biodiversity loss, et cetera, et cetera. So the policy we have presented is much broader than climate and our interlinkages between different uh, problems that we want to try to uh, address uh, in a new way. Um, I will try to stop here. I hope that gave a, a brief introduction to the um, EU policies of the Green Deal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, now let me turn to uh, Professor Van Iperzele. Um, as you know, Professor, the European Green Deal is a game changer. I think with the intervention of uh, Sarah uh, showed that again. Uh, but not only for EU members, it is a game changer for countries around the world because of the impact this deal could have uh, through its new rules uh, on energy production, on energy consumption. It's, um, the European Green Deal has also uh, an impact, a direct impact on trade. And maybe we will discuss about uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is um, viewed in different ways uh, according to the uh, continent you speak on. Uh, last month, uh, the foreign ministries, uh, ministers uh, adopted a very lengthy uh, conclusions uh, concerning the external dim dimension of the European Green Deal. So my question to you is uh, relates to, to COP26, which is an important uh, uh, meeting which will take place uh, at the end of this year, whereby there are lots of expectations on the European side. It is often said that um, COP26 would be a, a possibility for, EU, for the European Union to reassert its geopolitical strength through its own standards. And my question to you is, do you find this legitimate? Over to you, Professor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Roux. Um, uh, with your permission, as I'm a climate physicist, I, I think I, I'll first focus on, on some very important elements of uh, global uh, context. If I'm allowed to share my screen, I was allowed earlier, it doesn't work right now um, for some reason. I hope that uh, the, this is doable. The, I mean, it was doable at a minute ago, so I it, think, yeah. yeah. Yes, here it goes. It, it okay. Now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, because the, um, the EU Green Deal, of course, is, is a very important uh, element and um, uh, I'm sure um, it, it will um, play an important role um, in, in, uh, at COP26 in, in Glasgow in, in November. Uh, but 
On the other hand, and I'll play a little bit the devil's advocate uh, with, with your permission. Uh, if you look at this diagram, uh, which I like very much because it shows at the same time, uh, starting in 1850 on the left, the increase in the concentration of CO2, and it uh, gives the visual impression of what's happening actually, and that is the increase in thickness of the thermal insulation layer we are installing around the planet. And a little bit of insulation layer is good when you are cold, but when you are getting progressively too hot, it's not a good idea at all to continue to increase that, uh, the thickness of that insulation layer. We have passed the 415 parts per million threshold um, last, uh, over the last five years, and this concentration is still increasing, and you see the result on the right. The result on the right, starting again uh, at the end of the 19th century, is the increase in temperature, an increase in global temperature. You see we have gained more than one degree uh, Celsius already. And um, you see the red line there, which is the first uh, target uh, of the Paris Agreement, is not very far. And we are going to cross that target if we don't stop the increase uh, in the uh, thickness of that insulation, that thermal insulation layer. And the only way to stop it is to stop adding more CO2 in the atmosphere than what natural systems can absorb. Because we are starting to see the consequences of this increase in temperature, not so much by the increase in the average temperature, which is totally abstract and nobody can feel the global temperature. But what people can feel, feel is the effect of extreme events, such as heat waves, which are killing people in many parts of the world, including in, in Europe. Uh, we are seeing the impacts of floods, which, uh, which is affecting, starting to affect uh, not only people, but also infrastructure and the economy as, as a whole. And we know from the uh, IPCC special report uh, on the um, 1.5 degree C target um, published uh, two years ago, uh, that uh, if we want uh, to um, stay below 1.5 degree C warming, the uh, trajectory of global emissions for CO2, for net CO2 emissions, need to have the following shape. I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, um, a maximum value very soon, and then a huge drop to net the net zero value somewhere here. But look at the detail, because this is coming from the IPCC report, okay? The zero is here. Net zero means not adding more CO2 to the atmosphere that uh, what natural systems uh, can absorb. And it's often said, oh, the EU has a wonderful target because um, it aims at carbon neutrality, those net zero emissions by 2050. Well, this diagram is not about the shape that the EU emissions should have. It's about the shape that uh, global emissions should have. And as you can see, global emissions, yes, indeed, 2050, that's more or less where uh, it needs to be at net zero. As you can see, some uh, simulations, some uh, scientific results suggest a much earlier date for global emissions, actually. The earliest date is 2035 for global emissions. But then this is for global emissions. This is not for the EU. And Madame Nelen just reminded us, we have historical responsibilities in the EU. We have emitted a lot of the uh, accumulated uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. So one might think that the EU, because of its historical responsibilities on one hand, and because of its scientific and financial capacity on the other hand, could actually have, have aimed at uh, doing better than what is expected uh, for the world as uh, an average. Okay, so this may be put in perspective uh, what the EU uh, plans uh, to do and maybe could suggest uh, that much more uh, needs to be done. Because if you stand back and look at the um, way global emissions have uh, evolved um, since the uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century, you see that 
the general trends can actually be summarized by an exponential growth with this uh, rate of increase. The only exception are uh, from some years to the next, I mean, very short period of time, uh, and probably um, we'll see a, a very short-term effect of the COVID crisis uh, when we get the final numbers for, for CO2 emissions in 2020, but the global trend is really going in another direction of what's needed, because what's needed is to be on this green curve here in terms of global emissions. This is the business as usual, the orange thing, and this is the result uh, if the present nationally determined contributions are realized, uh, let's say to simplify things, it's, it would be uh, if they are realized this uh, um, uh, white dotted line here in 2025 for global emissions and still increased global emissions in 2030, we are very far uh, if those NDCs are not substantially improved from what's needed to, to be on the 1.5 trajectory leading to net zero by 2050. So it's clear, I think, and this is my concluding slides. Uh, I just have some resources that I will briefly mention after this. Uh, the impact of climate change are costing more and more, and we really need, uh, to, if we want to avoid more uh, costs, and when I mean costs, it's not only financial costs, it's costs in human lives, it's costs in uh, lost ecosystems as well. So the, the urgency is greater than ever. Uh, respecting the 1.5 degree C Paris Agreement objective is really essential, again, as shown by the IPCC special report published in, in, uh, 19, in uh, 2018. Net zero emissions are really required, particularly uh, for uh, the EU before 2050, because of the historical responsibility, as I mentioned, and as Madame Nelen mentioned as well, uh, and because the EU has um, the means to be actually more ambitious than uh, what it is at the moment. It's very important to point out that those emission reductions uh, and CO2, let us uh, remember that, uh, is 80% of the problem. I mean, if, we are, if I only speak about CO2 in this short intervention, it's not because methane, uh, CFCs, HFCs, HEFCs, etc. don't matter. Of course they matter. But CO2 is 80% of the problem. And CO2 is mostly coming from the burning of fossil fuel, coal, oil, and gas, and also from deforestation. And this is priority number one. Uh, to increase the CO2 absorption capacity you know, the net side, uh, what's on the other side of, of the net zero. Uh, and some countries are hoping that by, by promoting uh, planting trees and managing soils better, etc., they will achieve a big chunk of their uh, climate objectives. And that's an illusion, actually. The, 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 the most uh, reduction, most of the reductions really need to, to be obtained by a fossil fuel phase out. Uh, because what can be done uh, through forests and soils is at most a help uh, in, the, uh, in this context, uh, but shouldn't be the mainstay because the, uh, it's hard to measure, it's hard to guarantee in terms of effect, things about the effect of forest mm -hmm. fires, for example, when they happen. So separate bold targets for emission reductions and for absorption increases would be much better in the future. So we still have the choice. Uh, the EU has a very important role in this uh, context and the Glasgow conference at the end of the year will be very important. But even though uh, doing what has been announced, uh, it's certainly not going to be easy. I'm fully aware of that. I think uh, it would be even better uh, if the EU was uh, much more ambitious because we are now in the middle of that pandemics and we are looking at the waves here, the waves of infection, the wave of hospitalization, the wave of death due to COVID, but actually the waves of climate change are much bigger. And this is not uh, fully understood by many, including many policymakers uh, until now, unfortunately. If you read French, uh, this is a free book. If you read Dutch, this is another, the same free book. Uh, and uh, on this website, you'll be able to find the slides I've just shown to you uh, starting from tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the interesting uh, expose. And what I what I understand from the, your response to my question was that uh, to remain credible, the EU has to do more. Um, can I now turn to the third uh, subject uh, we wanted to tackle during this um, this webinar? the uh, participation and the involvement, the active involvement of uh, civil uh, society. It is um, um, it's a fact that the climate change is a, a sociological concern and the impact of human behavior on climate change cannot simply be rectified by what I call technical fixes. And the European uh, Green Deal, I think Sarah alluded to that uh, already in the beginning, uh, can only succeed if um, civil society is able to play its part alongside uh, governments and um, uh, regulations. So uh, my question to you, um, Nicola, is um, after the adoption of the European uh, Climate Pact, which happened uh, in December, early December 2020, uh, what is your view on this and what is your judgment? Do you think that uh, with this pact, um, civil society will be able to participate in uh, negotiations and will be involved um, in, the, in the process? Uh, everybody saw the pictures of Greta Thunberg uh, coming to the commission and uh, 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 alongside uh, Ursula von der Leyen. What is your view and, uh, and uh, I'm building on your experience, uh, how do you see things? Thank you very much. Um, my answer will be quite similar to Professor Van Ipperzeel's answer. Um, empowering citizens in Europe and worldwide means, I think, first delivering on the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So the, the, the European Climate Pact is a quite interesting tool, I think, to involve, involve civil society and to, to, to organize a dialogue between the EU institutions and the, the, the different stakeholders. But I think the, the most important part, if, if you want to empower European citizens, it to, is to deliver on the commitments that the European, European Union has taken in different areas, meaning one of them being climate change. And my first, my, my, my first um, assumption is quite positive. Uh, the, the, the European Green Deal, I think, maybe is not the big deal, but I think it's, it's a, game, a game changer. Mm -hmm. And we have to acknowledge that as civil society. Um, I, I will tell you when we first marched on the streets of Brussels on the 2nd of December, 2018, it was not the first march. As a matter of fact, we organized marches before Copenhagen, before Cancun, before Durban, etc. But the, it was the first march of that with with so many people on the street. And then the youngsters organized weekly marches, etc. At that time, it was a little bit more than two years ago. I never hoped to get what we got with the 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 EU Green Deal. I have to acknowledge that um, because there is an ambition that we had never seen with the previous commissions with uh, a, a coherent vision of what we have to do and bef because we have means, uh, financial means linked to that ambition. So things are getting better and uh, as civil society we have to acknowledge that but the main problem is today that the ambition is still insufficient, and Professor Van Ipposev showed it, is still insufficient to respect, to really respect the, the Paris Agreement. So it depends on whether, whether you, you see the, the positive part of the, or the parts we still have to improve. First of all, the ambitions on uh, climate, uh, on gas emissions reductions, 55% for 2030, the, the proposal uh, by the commission now endorsed by, by the council is really better than 40%. 40% was um, a, an ambition that was not compatible with the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now there is a question of climate justice. 
uh, that Professor Van Ipposel showed re really well is 55% for 2030 and climate neutrality for 2050. Uh, the, the just part by the European Union. We, we think it is not. And we, we endorse the position of the parliament that 60% uh, is a minimum. And that the, within the trilogue, the discussion between the commission, the council and the parliament, we hope the parliament will stay strong uh, and negotiate to, to, to go to 60%. Now, uh, those 60% must be linked to the other dimension of climate justice, there is the international climate justice, uh, the fact that we as uh, historically industrialized countries need to do more and also to fund the efforts by developing countries. You said, I, I work for the National Center for Development Cooperation. So my, my uh, first duty is to uh, call for more ambition also to support developing countries in their efforts, that is the basis of the, the climate agreement, more efforts, international commitments by all countries, which was not the case of the Kyoto Protocol, but linked to climate finance. Uh, that is one part of climate justice. The other part is social justice. The other part is a just transition, which is, which we can find within the, the, the EU Green Deal, but should really, um, be uh, stronger in, in, in the policies. And, and this is one of the things we are really looking at when we look at the EU next generation mechanism. Uh, there are interesting things linked to uh, the just transition. There is a just transition mechanism linked to the Green Deal. But if we want to really uh, get into a, a, this transition, we will we would really need more financial means. If you look at the, the, the Green Deal itself, the, the EU Commission uh, states that we will need 260 billion euros yearly to, to get to our climate objectives, but those are linked to the 40% the, the climate objective to 2030. So we, if we want to get to 55 or 60%, we will need way more money. Uh, and, and even uh, if we look at that 40% objective, the European Court of Auditors estimated to 1 trillion euros, the investment we need in 10 years. So this is a, a big part of the discussion that we will have to have in the next few years, how to get more money and how to go to new sources of funding. And we know that the, the EU Commission has proposed 10 years ago uh, at the time of the financial crisis to get a financial transaction tax at EU level for the EU 27 and not for only uh, nine or 10 countries. Uh, the, the, the commission's assumption at the time was that we could get 50 billion euros a year with the financial transaction tax. So we really think, think now that one of the priorities, if you want to fund the, the the Green Deal is to get that proposal by the Commission back on the table and not only conclude the discussion with the, the, the 10 countries that committed 10 years ago to, to, to implement that proposal. Um, so I said strong objectives, a path linked to the just transition uh, means there's also the question of governance but, uh, and that the, the EU Climate Pact is a way to improve the governance of the European institutions. What we, what we really saw as something positive is the fact that the, the Commission, when we got into this pandemic, the Commission clearly stated that it, it would stay strong on the, climate, on, the, on the EU Green Deal and that the next generation EU would clearly be linked to the climate objective. We know how the 37% the target uh, within the, 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 the national plans and the do no significant harm principle. The, those two tools are quite uh, positive. I have to, to recognize that, but then there is a question of coherence of all policies to the EU crime, the, the, to the EU Green Deal. And we have problems with some of the policies that, are, that have been adopted 
or are being adopted by, by the European institutions since the adoption of the Green Deal. Two of them being the common agricultural policy, mm -hmm. uh, which was adopted like <laughs> uh, with a quick backdoor deal in last October um, and is based on a proposal that was a proposal by the previous commission that, that came before the, the EU Green Deal. So we, we really think that the commission should retake that, pro that proposal and, and, and make a new proposal of, of a common agricultural policy that is coherent with the, the, the European Green Deal. We know that the the, the, the cap is one of the most important policies of the European Union. So adopting a common agricultural policy that is incoherent with the, the Green Deal um, could, could be um, really harmful for, for the, the implementation of the Green Deal. And then you have the trade agreements that the Commission is still trying to, to negotiate and, and, and to trying to have uh, the member states adopting those, those, climate, uh, those trade agreements. And we know that one trade agreement is particularly um, questionable, which is, which is the, the, the trade agreement with the Mercosur. We know that uh, there is a, a strong danger with that agreement. We know that Bolsonaro's policies are really uh, harming uh, international climate policies. We know all the dangers of uh, deforestation. We know also all the dangers to human rights in, in Brazil. So we really think that not only the, the EU uh, Mercosur trade agreement should be, um, the, the negotiations should be at least posed to have a discussion on, on the mandate of the European Commission, but that member states should discuss a new trade mandate by the European Commission. So my conclusion, um, the EU Green Deal is really a game changer. Uh, and we, we are quite happy to see that now, and it's a big difference with 10 years ago after the financial uh, crisis, we have a coherent instrument that can be used by European institutions to, to get us into that just transition, but it can be done better uh, we have proposals to do that, uh, but the, the basis should be the, the test that Professor Van Ipozil, uh showed us in his intervention, are we respecting the climate agreement, the Paris Agreement? And at this moment, I have to say that we're getting better, but we're still not respecting the, the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Thank you for this uh, very frank exchange. Um, and Sarah, let me get back to you with some questions I got also uh, on the question and answer and uh, reactions. Uh, first of all, among the, um, the many uh, legislative proposals that uh, you, uh, you, I mean, the Commission will put on the Council's table, what could be, in your view, the quick wins, uh, meaning by that the proposals which could rapidly and uh, visibly uh, give uh, results? And then there's another question uh, referring to um, the difficulty of maintaining the pact. And as uh, several, as, as Nicola was just saying, the, 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 the lack of co coherence, uh, the Vice President uh, Timmermans was pretty vocal on the issue of, um, of agriculture. Uh, there's also the, the trade issues. Um, if, you can, if you could respond to that, and then there's maybe a, a specific question on what about the bilateral agreements that the EU has with third countries on climate? Does this, does this exist and where does that fit in? That is a, a specific question that was put forward. Sarah, over to you. Uh, thank you, Francois. Um, yes, questions on rapid and visible results. Well, if it was uh, easy and rapid, then I think it would have been done already. So it's uh, unfortunately, um, yeah politics, policies, policies with 27 member states are never easy and rapid, I would say. This being said, um, are not rapid enough for 
we had the other we heard I heard the other panelists and the, these are of course differences between uh, the role of scientists the role of civil society and then uh, being in the <laughs> in the daily policy life where it's mm -hmm. all uh, negotiations and and little steps that have to add up but let me highlight a few things. Uh, in June uh, this year, the Commission will come um, with an important package with uh, around uh, 10 of the uh, relevant uh, laws regarding uh, or linked to uh, climate change, uh, where we will substantially revise them. And this, this is the um, ETS system. This is the effort sharing uh, regulation. Uh, this is renewable energy uh, directive as well, uh, energy efficiency, um, and many more. Uh, but just to point out that we take the commitments that we have taken climate neutrality and the 55% target by 2030 serious to come with these proposals. And we know that, of course, there will be consequences. Uh, if you look at energy um, and, and the part uh, it has in uh, CO2 emissions, um, it's clear that there as well, uh, the targets for renewable energy will have to be uh, much higher. Um, I think uh, the current 2030 target is around 32%. Uh, in our first impact assessment uh, presented last summer, we give a range of it has to go to 38, 40% uh, by 2030. And 2030 is now, uh, an investment cycle takes uh, several years. So we are working really against the clock and, and we want to present things quickly to have negotiations with the parliament and with the council quickly uh, because a 2030 target uh, and to come to, for instance, 40% renewable energy by then, um, it, it, is, um, it is quite a thing. Uh, on the other hand, and that I think is something that is different um, than 10 years ago and, and, and even a few years ago, the technology has evolved so quickly. So not only, well, the, the, the civil society pressure, the role of the youngsters and the uptake of politicians, but companies, uh, industry in Europe has made a very important shift and is ready with what were technologies that were developing that are now in a different stage. Um, one of the examples there uh, I could give as well is hydrogen. The hydrogen strategy that the Commission has, pre has uh, presented last uh, July, it was July 2020, that was one that was not uh, in the political guidelines. It came, um, yeah, there was a push inside and we've taken it up. And we had, um, yeah, an ambition of 40 gigawatt uh, capacity by 2030, uh, which was seen as incredibly, uh, a bit crazy, too ambitious. We see now that companies throughout Europe and also in the framework of the RRF uh, member states proposals are really putting this forward. And it shows how quickly it is also going on the ground. And that many of our big companies, tech and uh, others, CEOs have, have made a kind of switch. Uh, Timmermans, my boss, is for instance, instance, quite optimistic on what is happening on electrification of transport or the, the cars, um, different from, of course, uh, maritime and, and aviation transport, but uh, the car that uh, some of us still have, uh, that in uh, two, three years year time, the price of an electric car will be cheaper than uh, our cars with combustion engines. We see that the car sector is moving in that direction and that it is really changing. However, talking about and making a link with, uh, with previous uh, interventions where I have not yet focused uh, on enough um, is the just transition. Um, and here as well, while perhaps CEOs are making a switch, it's very important as well that the trade unions, the workers in an economy of today will be, it will be different jobs that are there tomorrow. A car today is not a car, uh, the electric car and the skills will be very different. And in order to also have people along and address transition, it's very important to have that dialogue as well uh, with workers, with people who will lose their jobs, with people who will need to be reskilled in order to find their place in, um, in a new economy. So nothing is easy, no easy results, but we have a lot of proposals on the table where we will uh, deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. The, maybe just, yes. I forgot the question on the uh, trade agreements, of course. Yes. Um, or, or no, it was bilateral agreements on climate uh, with different partners. Yes. Um, 
my boss, as a former um, foreign minister as well, is uh, I think half of his job at least is about uh, relations with third countries. Uh, mm. He's not traveling the world anymore, but uh, he has uh, contacts uh, with China, with the US, with South Africa, with India on a, on a, on a constant basis. And um, obviously as well in the light of the preparations of the COP, this is very important. Um, but uh, yes, there are um, agreements with the countries, for instance, on trade agreements, but also a lot of bilateral, specifically climate related um, contacts. And um, that is an, a, a very important uh, element in, in his job uh, where he uh, puts a lead, lot of energy to. Thank you very much, Sarah. And now I would like to turn to, to Professor Vani Perzel because precisely on this, I mean, the, the way we relate, uh, EU relates at the international level with uh, other countries. If we compare the situation today uh, with the one only a few years back, uh, we are coming out of his isolation. Uh, the United States is back. Uh, what, what is it going to change? I don't know. China made some announcements that they want to join in, um, Japan, South Korea, and, uh, and a few others. But there is a, there's a philosophical choice here. And I think I'm going to refer to that example of CBAM, which I, I received a question on that, on, on CBAM and the way EU relates uh, with uh, other countries concerning the, the Carbon Border Adjustment Tax. I mean, there are two ways to do it. Uh, either we go the uh, European fortress, you know, the green European fortress in, in a very brown world, I, and, and impose some sort of a tax, or we uh, trust multilateral uh, negotiations and we try to convince partners uh, to be as ambitious as, as we are. And Professor, my question to you is, what would, uh, in terms of efficiency, uh, be the best strategy to follow? Well, I, I'm, I'm a mere climate physicist and I'm not um, uh, a diplomat um, uh, or a political uh, analyst, but um, you know, they, they are, we, we should be aware there are very powerful um, forces um, who are doing everything they can to, to break uh, any movement. Uh, and to slow down any movement towards um, a, a greener and more sustainable uh, economy. And, and we shouldn't be naive. Um, uh, they are not going to be convinced just by talking nicely with them. You know, as I often say in my, in my lectures, the, um, uh, the, the, the language that um, most uh, economic actors, whether they are countries or big companies, the best language they understand is not negotiations around a glass of champagne or white wine, but it's the language of money. Because they do their accounting at the beginning, at the end, or the end of the year. And uh, if at some point uh, they start seeing that uh, using the atmosphere as a free dustbin is not going to remain free anymore, they will change their um, investment priorities just out, out, just out of uh, very coldly made computations about the cost of doing this kind of investment or that kind of investment. So if at some point uh, the uh, European uh, Commission or the European Council uh, puts on the table uh, very clear proposals uh, to its partners uh, that um, would uh, seem to cost them money if they don't change, they will listen. Now, of course, they will say this is totally unacceptable and uh, you cannot do that alone, etc. But still, I mean, um, aren't we a few hundred millions uh, consumers in the EU? And even though um, the uh, EU emissions are only representing between 10 and 15% of, of global emissions at this, uh, at this time, 
um, the, the, the economic weight uh, of the EU cannot, cannot be ignored. And if the EU does that kind of things, uh, clearly explaining that it's for the common good, that it's not only for the good of the European uh, economy and the European citizens, it will be hard uh, to, um, to, to, to fight uh, for the others. So I think, yes, I think that some clear language um, needs to be used and um, maybe others will, will follow. But who am I to say that? I'm just a climate scientist, you know? Thank you very much. Um, maybe I would like to, to rebound a little bit also what uh, Nicolas uh, said uh, about uh, the, the issue of, uh, of governance. Because uh, one thing which is very striking when it comes to the involvement of citizens in the uh, climate uh, debate is to see how polarized the situation is. I mean, you have on the one side, uh, the people who say we're not doing enough. And on the other side, uh, people are already saying that we're doing much too much. So uh, from your perspective, Nicolas, uh, how do you reconcile the, the, two, um, the two trends? Uh, and how do you see, I mean, what would be your solution to, to deal with this problem? Because we've seen it viv very vividly in some uh, European member states that uh, it, can, it, can, it can have a, a very hard impact on, uh, on policies. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the first answer is science. So <laughs> scientists mm -hmm. tell us that we're not doing enough. Uh, and we are quite lucky to, to here in Europe not to have a strong climate deniers movement. There are climate deniers in, um, in Europe, but it's not a political issue in most of European countries uh, as it is in the United States, for example. Um, so I, I think the big difference, and I, I mentioned it in my intervention, the big difference between 10 years ago and now is that uh, opinion leaders, most of the opinion leaders are supporting climate uh, ambition. Um, and, and even if you compare it to two years ago, as I said, um, I remember that uh, an important um, important minister in Belgium, uh, just in the aftermath of, the, of the, the financial crisis, answered to a question on, on climate ambition. I think it was just before Copenhagen. Um, and, and he said, this is not the priority. Uh, we are uh, facing a major financial crisis. We will restore the economy, then create jobs, and then we will uh, try to solve the climate crisis. And he was representing the mainstream policy makers of, of, of that moment, 10 years ago. Uh, now, two months ago, I met our Belgian prime minister, Mr. De Croo, uh, quite briefly. Uh, we went with uh, our national Saint-Nicolas uh, to, to meet him and, and call for more climate ambition and for Belgium to join the EU member states supporting at least 55%. And I was uh, quite delighted to, to hear his answer. He, he told me, well, Mr. Van Nuffel, two years ago, we were, um, we were hearing the, the noise of, of, the, of, the, of the citizens in, in the streets, but we were not convinced. But two years, two years have passed, and now we are convinced that we have to have more ambition. I think there is a big difference between four, three years ago and now. And I think there, there will always be people resisting to more ambition. But we, we see that if uh, opinion leaders and, and, and policymakers stay strong, as the commission stayed with the pandemic, we see that the, 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 the deniers or the, or the people resisting to more ambition changed their views too. We saw that in, in I think it was in, in April or May of 2020, the, the Czech prime minister stating that we should stop with the climate ambition and that the, the priority now was, was to, to stop the pandemic and, and restore the economy. And the commission stayed, stayed strong and the, the position of the Czech Republic changed 
So I think the solution is to stay is really to stay strong on the objectives and say there there will be no there is no way back of the ambition that was adopted with the Paris Agreement. There is no way back from the the EU Green Deal and. <laughs> What we need now is, is a way forward and, and more ambition. Uh, and you will always have deniers. But if you say, if you see the opinion pulse in, in the European Union, there is not so much resistance to climate ambition, I think. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Um, on a series of questions uh, of getting here, um, first of all, a question on the scope of the no harm principles. That's uh, one thing. And then a reaction on what the uh, Nicholas was saying um, concerning uh, the reference to science. I mean, this is a debate we are all already facing with the COVID-19. Huh? And, um, and uh, there is also, I mean, some sort of a discrepancy between the necessity to, to you know, to, to act according to science and the feasibility uh, for people who are suffering because of conditions they have to put up with when they lost their job and when they're in a very dire situation. So how, how, do you, how, do you, how should this be tackled? Maybe, I don't know who wants to answer that. Maybe Sarah, uh, Professor Vani Perzella, who wants to come in first? I can very briefly say something about it. Um, well, first indeed, uh, the role of science, I mean, obviously, um, crucial key i mean the whole the pol policy is based on um the the, the clear i mean uh, science uh, that there is now and, and and the updates on uh how quickly it evolves uh but as you mentioned uh, yourself ambassador the um the role of science uh, also in the COVID crisis uh, on the one hand it has been back as never before we rely on the knowledge of virologists, scientists, etc. On the other hand, you see the polarization at large in society and some um, sticking their heads in the sand and not just rejecting, uh, having alternative facts, etc. Mm. So this is, this is a wider societal problem, of course. But um, I think what Professor Van Ipperzele said in the beginning, um, the consequences of cli climate change are becoming very tangible for citizens. And that is a game changer as well, I think. And the commission to uh, on, uh, on Wednesday, yes, uh, tomorrow will um, adopt an adaptation strategy, an update of the 2013 strategy. And that has to do with very uh, concrete issues of people's daily lives about health, uh, the impact of the heat waves, and then the difference that you see when countries proactively take a stance on that and have policies on preparedness for that, um, it, it, it makes a difference. Um, so that, that is an element I think that, that is important uh, to um, come to changes in, in, in society that are probably, and I agree with uh, Mr. Van Nuffel, long lasting, that uh, it's, it's not uh, to go back. Um, um, one of the questions said something about return of the pendulum. I don't think so. I think the, the urgency will only be higher. We've seen on the slide the waves of what the COVID wave is and the um, a bit further away wave, but much bigger wave against which there is no vaccine, uh, against which we have to act uh, both on the climate neutrality, the CO2 emissions, but also on the climate resilience, the adaptation uh, and the measures uh, that, that we have to take already today uh, on this. Uh, water is one example as well on there is either too much or not enough. Uh, and this is, this is also a very concrete uh, challenge for people that uh, well, that makes that the facts are there um, and, and, and that politicians have to solve those problems as well. And they are climate uh, policy related. And moreover, um, obviously, there is this element of, of um, some non-believers or critical minds, which critical is always good. Uh, but the cost of non-action is something that, that we try to uh, emphasize as well. 
um, just closing our eyes and uh, not looking too much in the future uh, will only, I mean, year by year, the cost of taking uh, measures will be higher. And the, the, the vulnerability uh, or, or the, the real cost will be on those, the citizens that are most vulnerable, uh, poorer people, uh, migrants, etc. cetera. And, and, and that's another reason um, why uh, this just transition is, is, is important to also um, have a transition that takes on board those people and, and, and trying to convince them that, that that action is needed and is in their interest. And renovation, for instance, is one of the flagships uh, that the Commission has put forward, a renovation wave in Europe, um, where um, obviously the aim is to isolate houses better and build them differently um, so that our um, energy uh, um, is much more efficient, but also the energy bills will change if um, renewable energy uh, takes um, takes a, a bigger um, a bigger share of the energy in the future. And if you have um, uh, different ways of heating and uh, cooling, uh, this is also an, an, a factor that, that can be a, an advantage for people. Uh, and that's how we have to explain our policies to have everybody on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah, uh, Professor, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, I mean, I very much agree with what um, uh, Madame Nelen has just said. I, maybe just add a few um, uh, additional ideas. I mean, in general, prevention is, is cheaper than cure uh, in, 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 in this area as well. And, and not enough attention is, is, uh, is spent on, on preventing uh, climate change, preventing pa future pandemics, preventing biodiversity and, and uh, uh, extinction of, of species, etc. Um, on, on the cost side, we should uh, not only think about the cost of impacts, but also the, uh, think about the cost of, of fossil fuel dependency. I mean, too few people know that just in the EU, we are using, and Madame Nelen, please correct me if I'm wrong, about 1 billion euro per day, 1 billion euro per day, just to buy fossil fuel outside the borders of the EU. So that's almost half a trillion per year. So the, 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 the amount of money we, we spend on those non-renewable resources is huge. And if we uh, succeed shifting the economy towards a more circular and renewable uh, energy-based uh, system with much more energy efficiency um, uh, on the way, uh, everybody will, will gain. And the last comment I wanted to make is that I think um, uh, we would gain a lot as well by um, trying to find more synergies between uh, different uh, issues. I mean, just transition and, and, and uh, has been uh, one example, but there are many other examples. I mean, you know, air, air quality is, is very important as well. You know, 8 million people are killed every year by air pollution by bad air quality. If we are clever enough, and I'm talking about the world level here, not only the EU, if we are clever enough, and if we are able to reduce our fossil fuel dependency, which will be good for climate, it will also be good if we are clever enough for uh, improving air quality and improving the life of hundreds of millions of people who are now breathing uh, bad quality air. And, and this is just an example, because we could gain a lot by looking at the uh, full Agenda 2030, which, by the way, was adopted just two months before the Paris Agreement in 2015, looking at the 17 goals, including number one, which is eliminating poverty, not forgetting uh, Objective 13, of course, which is climate action, but looking at the, at, at the full range and, and search for synergies around all of them. And, and we would do you know, economies of scale, uh, synergies and, and gain so much by doing that instead of focusing on one problem on Tuesday, another problem on Wednesday and a third problem on Thursday, I mean, you know. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicolas, you wanted to react yourself? Well, to, maybe just a quick answer to your uh, question. I, I think if we want the European citizens to, 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 follow, to, to follow the lead, I think the social pillar is quite important. And, and uh, the fact that the, the 
and we, we talked about just transition and the fact that the Portuguese presidency now um, has now put the social pillar as one of its priorities. I think it's, it's quite important. We, we, we said about just transition, we, that the, the 2030 jobs will be quite different from the 2021 jobs. This means that we have to organize the transition from one kind of social mar uh, employment market to another one. And this means that we have to have a strong social Europe and, and, and strong social pr protection mechanisms throughout Europe, et cetera. So, and, and this is a big part of the answer because the European Union and member states need to reassure citizens, protect and show the way. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. I'm receiving uh, quite a few number of questions around CBAM and uh, the, the, the uh, carbon adjusted me mechanism. Um, the, I can sum it up into one question to Sarah. Uh, is CBAM crucial for the European Green Deal? I'm pretty sure of the response, but uh, <laughs> I, I would give uh, the Commission's representative the, the possibility to answer. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, it's not just the Commission. I think uh, most of our member states are very looking forward to uh, to this Commission proposal, which is part of the Fit for 55 uh, package in June. So it's not yet there. Uh, but I think actually not being there yet, it has already had his, its effect. Um, it is something that third countries, of course, are looking to. Um, and um, that 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 just by an, the announced effect is 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 already um, quite something, and it's part of uh, what uh, Professor Van Ipper de Sela said: uh, messages towards third countries and and being serious mm -hmm. with them. So this is uh, to be seen in that in that um, in that context. Um, but uh, it let, let me not hide that it is not easy um, to choose in what area um, this will apply. It's not going to be, uh, let me be clear on that, a proposal all across the board and that uh, it's going to concern um, uh, uh, at the same time a lot of different sectors. This is new and we have to, uh, to be careful and try it out. So the work is, uh, is, is ongoing on that. Um, it is um, something that has absolutely its role to play in the part of uh, our policy tools, but it's not the only one. I mean, let me, I mean, the, the other elements we have, uh, emission trading system, et cetera, et cetera, are also um, very important. But yes, it has its roles to play. We have committed to it. And uh, in June, you will know more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you. I mean, as this uh, webinar comes to a close, I would like once again to thank you um, and the audience as well uh, for attending. Um, I think this is just one uh, debate among many others uh, which are taking part uh, in all over Europe on a very important subject. And I think today's discussion uh, I'm not going to sum up, but uh, some ideas and some uh, principles, um, the fact that we should do more as Europeans to be more credible on the international scene, um, the fact that the social aspects are extremely important, and this idea that uh, there is um, the, the, the capacity of the European Union to convince other uh, powers is extremely important. I think mean, this was obvious in our discussions. But as I said in the beginning, this is only the start of a process because those these uh, proposals are now going to be discussed at different levels, uh, at the council level, of course, in the parliament and in with the civil society. So we'll have uh, chances to uh, take them back again. I mean, the very purpose of think tanks such as uh, Egmont is to provide neutral platforms uh, for stakeholders, institutions, but also member states, uh, members of civil society to debate on this uh, important issue. And this is why uh, we, we organize this uh, webinar today. So hopefully this will be maybe one of our last meeting in, um, in uh, the virtual sense, and then we'll have in a few months uh, time um, the possibility to meet, which would make the exchange all the more interesting. But thank you again for, for attending and for the, uh, your involvement um, and your participation in this very interesting uh, webinar. Have a nice evening and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.